So let's just uh, head off here. Um, I'm going to tell you, start out by just telling you a little bit about ourselves and what we do so that we can frame the, the discussion a little bit in, in that respect. We're a Scandinavian firm or a Nordic firm. We have offices in Stockholm and in uh, Copenhagen and in, in Oslo. Uh, we have a team of 25 professionals. We made 28, 29 uh, investments, meaning we bought 28, 29 uh, companies. Uh, we have 14 of them still in our holding uh, today. Uh, the other ones have either been listed or sold on to other uh, companies. Uh, and uh, we have about a uh, little under $2 billion uh, in their management, and our investment track record has been reasonably good since, since uh, inception. Uh, we've grown quite uh, quickly. Uh, we uh, are just about to close our fifth fund, which is going to be 1.5 uh, billion uh, Canadian dollars. Um, investors are totally global. Um, and there are basically three or four types of investors. Uh, most of them are, or about 35, 40% are pension funds. Then there's insurance companies. The sovereign wealth funds and the university endowments. Now, we use this picture to kind of introduce ourselves when we meet new companies, when we need founders, uh, when we buy a new company and we want to explain to the union what are we all about. Uh, and we use it in recruiting. And the point of, of showing this slide is that you know, we're not working for faceless uh, institutions. We're actually working uh, for real people. So I point to the Swedish pe pensioner there when we get a new uh, employee in the door and I say, remember what you're doing here is you should think about this as managing your grandmother's savings. She wants two things. She wants her pension protected and that's not a given in the current environment. Most pension funds are struggling with actually delivering on their promises. So that means that people have either have to work longer or they get get uh, smaller pensions. Um, so she wants return. We need to generate return. That's why we've hired to manage their money. But increasingly, she's becoming very conscious about that return being generated in a responsible manner. And I just talked upstairs about ESG and corporate social responsibility. So that's very uh, important. So since the inception of the firm, uh, we have been very mindful of creating a culture which radiates integrity, uh, transparency, and trust. These institutions give us money for 10 years. That's a long time. And they write big checks, 50, 60, 70, 100 million dollars uh, they give to us for 10 years. And if they don't trust us, we're going to go out to business. So. We've been mindful of creating that type of culture. If you're going to have culture, you need values, and values which is codified behavior. Um, and we try to summarize uh, those values uh, in our ethos, which says we're decent people generating a decent return in a decent way. And what we mean by that is that we seek to attract uh, and recruit people of character and integrity. Uh, we mold those people into a strong team. Making a decent return means that we need to beat the index by 900 basis points. That's real alpha. So we're an expensive asset manager. These pension funds, they can buy the index for 5, 10 basis points. They pay us 200 basis points, and they pay us 20% of the profit that we make on, on the investment. So we're very expensive, so we need to justify that. And then generating uh, this return in a decent way means that we've developed our own code of conduct, uh, which is based on UN Global Compact and the OECD guidelines for corporate governance. We take that code of conduct, and we implement it in each uh, new investment we make. So we have a process with the board, with the management group, and all the way down to the factory floor. Uh, everybody has this code of conduct stapled to their employment agreement, so it's physically there. But it's not a document which is the key here. It's a process we have around it, whereby, whereby we establish very clearly uh, 
the type of behavior we condone and that we'd like to see and the type of behavior which is clearly out of bounds. And by doing that, we think we create more uh, robust and, and uh, uh, risk-free um, uh, investments. What exactly do we do? How do we invest in private equity? Well, uh, very quickly, if we buy a company for $100 million uh, and that company makes $10 million profit, we paid 10 times the profit okay, for the company. Now, our, one of our main investment criteria is that we need to see the potential to double that profit over the next uh, five years. So imagine we do that. Now we've got a company that makes $20 million. If we can sell it for 10 times, which is what we bought it for, we have a $200 million investment. Now, so that gives you an IRR of 15% and two times. It's okay, but it's not spectacular. So how we, do we turbocharge this? We basically do what you do when you buy a house. We go to the bank and take out the mortgage. And this way, we don't have to put in the entire 100 million, but we only need to put in 50 million. Now, that over five years, the loan is paid down. So say we paid out half the loan. And now you're left with, it's a typo here, it shouldn't be 100. My adding isn't very good here, obviously. I'm not good with numbers. Uh, uh, 175 in equity, and now you have a return of three and a half times money and an IRR of 28%. So, very simple model, looks very simple. The real tricky part is doubling the profit. That's the hard part. That's the art of what we do. Now, I'm not going to talk, that's also what's closest to my heart, but now if we talk about investor mindset, you know, what we do in private equity is kind of two things. You've got to be a good investor and you've got to be a good owner. A good owner we can leave for next year. Good investor is, uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Now, what is it that goes into being a good investor? Well. You know, we have to source, we have to find companies to buy that sourcing. You know, could you buy cheap and sell high? Well, if we can, we'll do it, but that's not very sustainable. The market's pretty efficient. Deal execution, how we actually transact is very important. Doubling EBTA is important. Getting the right leverage, assessing the risk. All those are elements that go in. And then you have an X factor. And I'll get back to the X factor. The main pitfalls of making investments. And there's kind of three that, that stand out. The first one is psychological. You know, we have a tendency of going with the crowd. That's the safe route, doing what the market is doing. We'll see what that can lead to. Uh, the psychology in the room, you know, what is the psychology when you're making a, a big investment decision? That can really influence the quality of decision that, that, that you make. Let me give you one example. Back in 2010, we made, no, 2009, we made two investments we're not particularly proud of. And that was largely because we had the wrong psychology in the room. And psychology goes as follows. We had a partner, uh, a great guy, we were very fond of him, uh, very intelligent, very smart. He just didn't have an investor mindset. Uh, and he'd been with us for five years, came out of BCG, the consulting firm, and he still hadn't done a deal. And you can't be a partner with us unless you do deals. So then uh, one day he comes up with two investments that on the face of it looked pretty good. Now, you know, we, we didn't turn the blind eye, far from it. But the psychology in the room was, you know, this elephant had been growing we, we knew we were facing a very painful decision, and oh, here it comes to two deals. We don't have to do that. So, you know, essentially, we let him do those two deals. We didn't push him as hard as we should have had. We weren't as diligent in reviewing the deal, and the deals fell out of bed after six months. Two dumb deals. We didn't lose our money, but they're never going to be very good. Good, uh, good investment. So that's the psychology in the room. And you know, when you, if you do three or four or five, six good investments in a row, something happens in here. 
you start getting a little careless. That's also psychology. So, you know, staying focused. Uh, the third point here is mind the gap. What do I mean by that? Well, most investors, professional investors, has a framework or rules that they invest within. Then something happens, the financial crisis, and then they panic and they do something that is outside the scope of those rules. And that can really get you bad results. So your biggest enemy in making investments are yourself. Humbleness is very, very important. We'll talk a lot about that. Uh, market, with respect to market pricing, too high regard for own qualifications. You know, this industry is full of masters of the universe. Um, uh, lack of objectivity, again, the same thing, you know, I know better. And the final point is craving risk. You can't make investments unless you're willing to take on risk. And some people just can't deal with that. Some very smart people keep analyzing, keep analyzing. They just can't pull the trigger. And in investments, you've got to pull the trigger at one, at one stage. And it's got to be from down here. You know, you can't get any further up here. So let's talk a little bit more in detail about um, this. Um, well, a picture tells a thousand words. Going, you know, you know the concept of alpha and beta return. Beta return is what you get if you buy the index. Alpha return is what you get if you manage to outperform the index. We're in the alpha business because that's what we we are paid for. Well, you're not going to create, you're not going to beat the index by going with the market. And you may actually walk, walk off a cliff. Now, pricing, this is the Schiller index. You've, you've seen this? This is basically 135 years, 10 year rolling ratio, price earnings ratio. And I don't know if you see it, but uh, you know, it, to me, it seems pretty high right now. Uh, it was exuberant in 2000. That's when uh, the whole market became ir irrational. Uh, people were talking about the new economy where cash flow and earnings didn't matter anymore. It was eyeball accounting, which was the big thing. Uh, that didn't go so well. Um, and you can see the financial crisis coming back up again. So the market in general is quite fully priced as you speak. It's actually very fully priced. Now, what's it like in the, in, the, in, the, in the private market where we operate? Well, if you look at European buyouts, these are private companies that are being bought, the type of companies that we buy. You can see that the multiples of earnings that these companies have been bought at has actually been climbing up. It came back down in the financial crisis, but it's, it's increasing. And what's driving this? Well, part of it is that the banks get exuberant from time to time. They were totally exuberant in, in 2007 and were willing to give too much loans. So what happens to housing prices when, the, when the, the mortgage market is very easy? Well, you drive up housing prices. That's exactly the same thing that happens here. But something more is going on here. And that is that you know, if you look at the equity that you have to put into a deal today relative to what you had to put in in 2004, now you had to put in six times equity uh, versus three times equity in 2007. So what do you think is the result of all of this? Returns are coming down. That's the only way you can get this to work. So either um, the buyers here are underwriting at lower return requirements, buy, or they have a perception bias. They think that, ah, this time is different. It's going to stay up there. We're going, to, we're going to be able to make the same amount of money, even though we put in twice as much capital. So pricing is, is a real issue in, in, uh, when, when you're making it. Uh, what is the right price? What is the implication of, of buying in at, at the right price? Now, the flip side of this, of course, is the risk picture. Um, so let me give you three observations uh, on how we look at risk. 
so you get a sense of how we think about that. First ob observation is that risk eventually catches up with you. What you're looking at in this picture is 300 years of annual equity returns in the UK stock market. And it's a pretty nice bell curve. Little skewed to the right, so on average, you make six, seven, eight percent uh, over this period. Now, you have so-called tail in events in the market, and we just had one in the global financial crisis, meaning sooner or later you find yourself in the left-hand tail. And people make the mistake about risk, they use probability calculations. And if you use probability calculation on that slide, guess where you're gonna end up? Smack back in the middle. And that's not very useful. But so you need to build portfolios and companies that are robust enough to withstand the tail in event. Because if you don't survive a tail in event, you lose all your money. You never recover from that. And it's all gone. So we are quite mindful in leaving, you know, a little headroom in our leverage. We typically don't take all the leverage we can get unless we have a very safe business. And we have one such now, which we levered up quite, quite uh, highly. Uh, and we generally run our portfolios relatively conservatively. We will drive and get that 25% return, which is our return requirement, by doubling EBTA. If we can do that, we don't need to get greedy on turning up the tur turbocharges. Now, the other observation uh, about risk is that when measures of risk are low, like low volatility and low risk premiums, and, and risk premiums are low, people, people typically think risk is low. It's 180 degrees the opposite. This is when risk is at its highest. Now, why am I saying that? You know, we think about risk as being low in a uh, upturn in the business cycle and high in a, a recession. What actually happens is that risk accumulates through an upturn in the business cycle and it just materializes in a recession. And if you think about risk that way, you start thinking contrarian. Now you're not going with the sheep anymore. You start investing at the right point in time and you start selling at the uh, right point in time. You wouldn't mind that? Now the final observation uh, about risk is that risk is such a multifaceted animal that it's kind of hard to get your head around it. Uh, so we've tried to simplify it and we just put risk in two buckets. One is what we call the beta bucket and one is what we call the alpha bucket. Now, the beta bucket, we put all the risks that we cannot control. Um, oil price, commodity pricing, uh, cyclicality, political risk, weather. We almost bought a sporting goods uh, business, a ski equipment business uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, the next winter there was no snow. So you can imagine how well that would have gone. Uh, that's a totally uncontrollable factor. Now, why are we not happy with exposing ourselves to business with high beta uh, risk? There's two reasons. One is we like to sleep at night. We don't make bets. We don't speculate in things we can't control. And the second is that our, if you go after the beta risk, you generate beta return. As I said earlier, our uh, pension funds and uh, endowments and sovereign wealth funds, they can buy beta return for 10 basis points. They don't need to, to pay us 2 and 20, as it's called in the, in the private equity lingo, 200 basis points, management fee, and 20% and of the upside. So we're not adding any value there. Now, the other bucket, alpha bucket, is we have to address, because you can't make investments without taking risk. And the alpha a bucket is integration risk, operational risk, people risk, governance risk, etc. These are all the risks that we have to be good at controlling and working with. And in fact, when we start changing a company, because you have to transform and change a company if you're going to uh, double uh, the profitability, we actually raise those risks. 
So we have to have good systems, procedures, and processes, and good governance to control that.